Hey ho! So it's ten o'clock. We're gonna get started. So th <coughs> this is um. Are we doing? Yeah, we're through. I think we're up. Uh, so as you might guess, this is the first time I've ever done this. Um, so we're going to try this out and see if live programming is something worth experimenting with um so this is the very first go i'm still figuring things out so consider this all very pre-alpha um my plan today is to uh, go through the rustlings um exercises or as many as i can one of my so i'm starting a year-long sabbatical and uh, one of my goals for the sabbatical is to uh, do various things related to programming. I don't get to do enough programming in my job. I teach other people how to program, but I don't, ver don't do enough of it myself. And one of the things I would like to understand better t to decide if I care about it and whether I want to use it in classes um, is uh, the Rust programming language. So... Um, one of the things I'll be doing on some of these streams is writing code in Rust. Um, I actually have some specific projects I want to implement, um, but I figure in these in this first stream or two when I'm just trying to figure out if this even works, um, I want to do something really simple. Uh, and so we're going to give uh, this rustlings thing a shot. It's a set of exercises, an interactive set of exercises that have been developed by the Rust community to go over basic features of Rust. I did part of it several years ago, um, but it's been a long time. And so it won't be completely fresh, but it will be mostly fresh. Um, and so hopefully uh, we'll um, be able to... Um, both learn a little rust together and I can see if this gear software etc like does a thing that's useful so um, let's get started so this is the rustlings website um, I'm gonna clone the repo um, get clone pion go to rustlings and now I'm going to open up VS code in this directory and terminal make that bigger oh yeah fine go away um, clearly I'm going to have to work on all the mini announcements and things that are going to come up because we don't really want or need them and that's going to be a nuisance. Um, so now, uh, I think I just say rustlings and, oh, it did not like that. Um, what happened there? Hmm. Let's see. Uh, make sure that it wasn't something else I was supposed to do. Oh, I wasn't supposed to just clone it. I was supposed to curl it. Oh, fine. That's what I get for being silly. Um, so let's get rid of the directory I created and we'll do the curl command instead. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it presumably has to uh, set up the development environment so it knows where everything is. It's obviously fetching some crates. Uh, this will take a little while. I hope not too long. Um, and uh, it checked that I had get. I don't know why it needed CC. Um, yeah. No idea there. Rust up, if you're not familiar with it, is the tool that you use to manage Rust versions. If you want to have multiple versions of Rust on your system, you also use it to do things like set target, um, compilation targets, 
So um, if you want to do WebAssembly in Rust, which um, I hope to actually do a one or two or three, I don't know quite how many it will take, uh, but do some episodes building a web app, a simple web app in Rust. Um, and so you actually write your code in Rust and compile instead of to native um, code on your architecture, um, x86 on this Mac, um, for example, you compile to WebAssembly, which you can then run in the browser like you would run JavaScript. Um, and then, and to rust up, you use that to say, hey, I want the target of this compilation to be WebAssembly instead of um, your native language or architecture. Rust, obviously it needs. Cargo, if you're not familiar, is the um, uh, package manager system for Rust. So if you've used uh, JavaScript, ecosystem NPM would be a rough equivalent. Or if you've worked in the Java land, Maven or Gradle would be um, rough equivalents of what Cargo does. Um, that verified that my Rust was up to date, um, cloned the repo like I did basically, but um, uh, is doing all this other stuff as well. Um, and now we're installing the Rustling executable. The stuff down here is um, Cargo is downloading crates. Um, so crates are what the Rust people call packages. Um, so a package in NPM or a library in Gradle is a crate in Rust. And um, is similar to, in particular, NPM. Um, if you have a lot of dependencies, you can get a fairly lengthy download process, such as this. Um, which uh, clearly in a standalone video, you would fast forward over this, but um, in a stream, we don't really have the option. So I just babble, I guess. Um, uh, I'll say while this is waiting, if you have any feedback on any of this audio, um, the video setup, things like font sizes. It's not clear to me like what kinds of sizes people are likely to be viewing any of this at. Nope. Down to stuff. And now we're compiling the libraries, um, uh, which depending on the libraries can take a little while, but hopefully this will go reasonably quickly. Um, so yeah, if you have, uh, feedback on things like window sizes and font sizes, let me know. Um, uh, it's never obvious if people are going to be watching on uh, a phone or a tablet or some, you know, 27 inch monitor. Um, and so what's an appropriate size to make this readable and usable? Um, uh, so we're at 45 of 47. Well, I think we're actually compiling rustlings now. So I think we've compiled all the dependent crates and we're down to actually compiling the program in question and yay, it finished. Okay. And so now, um, we have the rustlings directly directory. And in that is other stuff. Um, where did it put? Ah, so it put rustlings in my dot cargo bin rustlings um, directory. So I think maybe I can run rustlings from wherever I want. But I actually do want to uh, start VS Code here because I think this will have the files that I want to. Um, uh, be running. Oops. Where am I? I think 
maybe I'm going to close this because I left that open when I deleted the directory and who knows what confusion may have resulted. Um, terminal. Do, do, do. Okay, so now I think we can say rustlings. Um, let me make this bigger. Okay, welcome to Rustlings. Thanks for installing Rustlings. Is this your first time? Don't worry, Rustlings was made for beginners. And it really is. Like the first few exercises are going to be super simple. They assume you know nothing about Rust really. And it'll get more complicated as we move on. If you've got any prior experience with Rust, this will probably be like totally boring to watch. Um, but if you're new to Rust and you're just curious about what's going on with Rust, <clears throat> this might be a nice way to um, sort of walk through and get a sense of what's happening um, in the language and whether it's something you might care about. Um, so the central concept behind Rustlings is that you solve exercises. Um, these exercises usually have some sort of syntax error, the, error in them, which will cause them to fail compilation or testing. Sometimes it's a logic error instead of a syntax error. Your job is to find the error and fix it. Um, you'll know when you fixed it because the exercise will compile and Rustling will be able to move on to the next exercise. If you run Rustlings in watch mode, it will automatically start with the first exercise. Um, if you're stuck on an exercise, you can run this Rustlings hint exercise name. Um, uh, if exercise doesn't make much sense, you can go um, and create an issue. Okay, so let's do um, uh, Rustlings Watch, I think is what we want. Yep, so it says down here, run Rustlings Watch. So we're going to do that. Okay, um, so... Uh, this first exercise automatically compiles and works. Um, and we can move on to other exercises. However, one thing they've done is they don't automatically move forward. There's a comment in the code and you have to um, remove that comment and then it will go forward uh, to the next exercise. Um, so, uh, it tells us where we are. We're in exercises intro, intro1.rs. So let's open up exercises, intro, intro1. Um, so this is basically the whole print statements. Um, and we can't get us to move forward unless we remove this comment. So I will remove this comment. Boom, boom, boom. Save. Now, I think Wrestling's Watch will automatically notice that I've saved, recompile, and move forward. So we now have a check mark saying we successfully ran intro, intro 1 RS, and it's moved on to the next one. So it tells me that there's in intro, intro 2.rs, there is a compiler error. Um, so let's open up intro 2. Um, now, it says, make the code print a greeting to the world. Execute blah, blah, blah for a hint. Let's actually do that so we see what that looks like. So I'm going to copy that. I'm going to make a new terminal. Um, let's make you a lot smaller. Um, and the hint is to add an argument after the format string. Okay. So we'll come back here. So in Rust, this is a, f well, actually this whole thing is a format string. And the curly braces are used as placeholders. It's like string interpolation in JavaScript, for example. And the print line command assumes that there'll be one extra argument for every pair of curly braces. And those arguments will be inserted into uh, the, where the curly brace is. So um, if we add world, this value is going to be inserted where the curly braces go. And that should, indeed, we print hello world. So we now successfully do this one. It won't move forward until I remove the I am not done. 
Now, this is a little weird, like why would you put a string here? Uh, a perhaps more plausible version of this is, you know, to say who to greet is world, and then who to greet, and it will still succeed. Um, and we could change this to the entire world. And we should get hello, the entire world. Yeah. So um, this would be a more normal, quote unquote, use of uh, uh, format strings where we would have a variable or some expression uh, that would then be interpolated into there. So that seems good to me. I'm going to move on. And obviously, uh, if you've got questions, definitely let me know. Um, feel free to pop up. Um, or I'll be posting this, uh, the full recording of this on YouTube later. Um, if you are watching it there uh, and have questions, feel free to ask questions um, in the comments there. Okay. So we have successfully did intro, intro two. So now we've moved to the variables section. So we don't need to be an in intro anymore. We need to be in variables and we're in variables one. Um, so it says, make me compile. X has the value blue. Um, now, depending on what your experience is, this might look like this should work. Um, Certainly there are plenty of languages where this could, or something like this could work. Like I think something very similar to this would work in Python, for example. In Rust, you have to declare variables. You can't just start using them like we are doing on line eight. You don't have to provide a type, but you do have to declare them. And the, the syntax for that is let. Um, so if we do a let, think that will make this work. Yep. Now we can um, specify a type in the declaration if we want. Um, so we could say I32, for example, the numeric types in Rust all have um, their sizes included in them. So there's like things like I8, I16, I32, I64, I think I128, I don't know, we should find out. You can always ask the computer, right? Yep, there's an I128. So these are how many bits are allocated for this variable. So I've now allocated 128 bits to store the number five, which actually only needs uh, three bits. So I could get away here with I8 um, and it should work just fine. There's also U for unsigned integers. I gives you both positive and negative values. The U variables give you unsigned integers, so zero and up. Um, so U8 would go zero to 255, whereas I8 would go minus 128 to positive 127. Um, there's also F. Um, now I don't think eight's an option. Um, F32 and F64 seem to be the options. Um, now it didn't like that because the value on the right hand side is an int and it didn't automatically cast it to be a float. If we change it to be uh, a float, then it works. Um, it's worth noting that um, Rust compiler errors are frequently quite informative. Um, and will often even give you a hint as to what you could or should do instead. So here it was like, hey, because we said F32, we were expecting a float here and we had just an integer and it's like, oh, you know, if you just say 5.0 instead of five, it'd be good. Um, so it, the Rust compiler isn't always gonna tell you what you need to know, but it's remarkably common in my limited experience that the Rust compiler will tell you what you needed. Um, and so, you know, that's awesome. So I'm going to take this back to uh, being uh, an I32 
we'll say that that's done and I'll get rid of that. Okay, and now we're, so we're succeeding variables one, variables two needs to be dealt with. Um, and so what's the error? The error is we declare the variable, but it wants a type. Um, I wonder why it needs a type here. Oh, because X doesn't have a value. If we'd assigned a value to it, then X would have a value and we would, it would be, and be able to infer a type from that, but there's no value, so it can't infer a type. So the, the hint here is to consider giving X a type. We could do that. I think we'll still have a problem because it's gonna, I think, be require us um, to give X a value initially. Um, yeah, so we get an error, the use of possibly uninitialized X on line eight. So really the type didn't help. Um, it didn't hurt, but it didn't help. Um, if we instead gave it a value that would allow it to infer a type, it runs successfully. Uh, and because X is not eight, we print not, or not, X is not 10, we print not 10. If we change this to 10, we should get 10 down here. And you can see that if syntax is pretty straightforward, um, you don't need parentheses around the tests like you do in more C-based languages. Um, they did stick with the double equals for a quality test. Arr, terrible idea. Really just the worst. They really should have had like colon equals for assignment and then single equals for test. But whatever, they didn't ask me. Okay, so we're good there. Moving on. Okay, so so actually I should open variables three. So we let x be three, we print x, we let x be five, and we print five, and it doesn't work. This would work in basically almost any imperative language that I've ever worked in. Um, and the fact that it doesn't is actually super cool. It's one of the things that's really nifty about Rust that makes me super happy. Um, so uh, let's look at the error down here. So it's saying cannot assign twice to immutable variable X. So this first assignment to X, um, and then we've got the second assignment, it says cannot assign twice to immutable variable. In Rust, by default, all variables are immutable unless you say they should be mutable. This is the exact opposite of almost every other language I've ever interacted with that had mutability. If you get into pure functional languages, it's a whole different kettle of fish. Um, but in Java, for example, you can say something's final as a way of saying it's immutable, although actually that doesn't always do what you thought it was going to do. Um, but by default, variables are mutable and you have to declare them to be final. Um, and that's true in a number of other languages. In Rust, it's the opposite. Every variable is considered immutable unless uh, you declare it to be mutable. And they suggest a hint here, which is actually quite useful. We'll just make this mutable um, instead of um, immutable. Uh, and I think the syntax is let mute X. Um, so we're saying X is going to be a mutable variable, which has value three, and then that will allow us to reassign it. So let's see if that works. Indeed it does. So it prints three and then it updates it and prints five. So there we go. That worked swell. Um, boop, bop, beep, boop. Um, I'll make this a little narrower. So we're done with three, on to four. Um, so it's not happy because we've got an uninitialized variable here. So, we've, so this is basically what we did before. 
we it's declared but it doesn't have value so if we give it a very value here we should be good yeah that's pretty straightforward okay variable five okay expected a string found an integer okay so here we declare number to be a string and then we print it and then we redefine it to be a number and it's all grumpy because this was a uh, string and now it's a number and it doesn't know what to do uh, with that now notice we're also reassigning so you might think that adding mute here would be a good idea but that's not going to actually solve the problem because it doesn't change the type issue um, we're still this is a string and we're trying to assign a number to it and that's just not going to be good um, let's actually um, do the hint on this one and see what they say okay so they say we we know how to make things mute but that's not going to help us um, and so we're using shadowing which is what I thought they were going to say um, so in rust you see this is actually really common if I say let again then it's like I'm oops, sorry. It's like I'm declaring this a second time, um, and the new declaration shadows or replaces the previous declaration. So this is like creating a new variable here that will hide the existence of the old variable, um, and the new variable gets to have a new type and a whole new life. And actually a very common usage of this is in fact when you have a variable of one type and you want to convert that in some way, <clears throat> you're going to do something that generates a new value of a different type, but you'd like to use the same name because it was a good name. It was the right name for the thing. Maybe it was a message and the message had the type you know, it was like some kind of JSON body and a REST response. Um, and you want to extract from that the string um, in some field or something like that. And you might want to use the, the name message because it's a good name uh, for both places. And shadowing like this does exactly that. It lets us cr take an old name, give it a new life with a new type and, and new values. So this, I think, will solve the problem. Hey, looky, we are happy campers. And so we have solved variable five, and we've spelled three, and we've done addition. Okay. So on to, oh, oh I need to say I'm not done. And then we'll go on to variable six. Um, so... We declare a constant and we try to print it. Um, and the compiler warning is that we have to provide a type for a constant. It turns out that in Rust, constants have to have types. In other places, it'll do the inference. It has to have types here. I'm honestly not sure why they treat constants differently in this setting. Um, I assume it's probably to do with how memory is allocated in the compiled image because um, constants are probably uh, treated differently. But um, for whatever reason, you have to have it. And so I think if we just de define that as having um, uh, the type integer 32, then we're good. Okay. And that gets us through all the variable ones. Uh, so if we get rid of that, we should be moving on to functions. Now, before we do that, I am going to actually, just because I'm a little nervous about the world, 
Um, I'm actually going to check that I am, in fact, streaming. Oh, it says I'm live. That's cool. Um, da -da 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 -da. No. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to call that a win, and we will assume that this is working. Um, so let's, I'm going to close all these. We've got too many windows going. Close all, and close variables, and let's move to functions. Um, okay. So call me is not found in this scope. So we're calling a function. There isn't one. So I think all we have to do is just define a function. Let's see what the hint is in case they're, they've got some vision for what this function should do. Right, so let's clear that. Do that again. The main function is calling a function that it expects to exist, but the function doesn't exist. It expects this function to have the name call me. It expects this function not to take any arguments and not return any values. Sounds a lot like main, doesn't it? Oh, that's the clever trick. So they're suggesting that we can just, you know, use the same basic format as main. Um, and we don't have to return anything. So I think that will actually do the job. Oh, I gotta switch back to the wrestlings tab. Yay, we did it. Um, and we'll see more function stuff here in a second, so I won't mess with that. Uh, we'll just move on. So here we are. Uh, we're going to call call me with the argument three. Then we're going to have a loop and we're going to print something. And it's unhappy because we didn't provide a, fun a type here. So in Rust, all function arguments have to have types. I don't think you can infer function arguments in any context. So uh, we can uh, infer what's passed in, but we have to actually provide an explicit type um, when we define the function. <laughs> so uh, we'll go with i32 again, because why not? And I think that's going to be it. So. Um, three gets passed in and assigned to num. We can see this for syntax, which I suspect we'll see more of later, um, for i in, and then you can have enumerations, so zero dot dot num. One thing I think they did get right is they made their enumerations by default, inclusive on the left and exclusive on the right. Um, so this goes um, zero, one, two, actually is what this enumeration returns. And so they add one to it here to get it to be one, two, three. Um, and so this loop prints three times and we're happy campers. Okay. So I'm going to make that go away. And we'll open function three. Um, so what's the error here? Call me. We supplied zero arguments, but we expected one argument. So. Um, this is the fix code from before, although they made it a U32 where we called it an I32. Um, given that this is a range, it doesn't really make sense to have negative values. That was probably kind of a clever trick. Um, so we just need to put a 5 in here or some other number, and it will do the thing. So if the function is declared to take an argument, we have to provide one or it won't compile. And so one thing that suggests is that there aren't, at least in a simple sense, things like optional arguments um, that we have to provide the right number of arguments and they have to have the right type. Um, okay, so here we're actually defining a function that returns a value, um, but it doesn't have uh, the type of the value declared. So the store is having a sale where the price is an even number, you get 10 rust bucks off. But if it's an odd number, you get three rust bucks off. So um, it takes the sale price. It's supposed to return the sale price, and it doesn't return a, a type here. If the price is even, we'll subtract 10. Otherwise, we'll subtract three. 
So let's say that we're going to return an I-32 here. Um, and that, I think, will make the problem go away. Now, now, while I'm here, it's worth pointing out something which will, I think, be an issue in some of the later exercises. Notice that there is no return statement here anywhere. Um, in Rust, everything is an expression with value. And the last expression, the, its value is what is returned by a function. And so this implicitly returns price minus 10 or price minus 3. And it's apparently more rusty um, to not explicitly say return. I personally find that challenge. I'm really used to saying return and I kind of like the clarity that that gives me about what's happening. Um, but I'm going to try to be like a rust person, um, a rust station, uh, and do it without the returns. But it's not, I think, going to be easy for me to get used to that. But we'll cope. And then we have is even, um, and we see an example here of, of returning a different type. We haven't seen the bool type yet. But it takes an I32 number and returns a bool, which is num mod 2 being 0. Okay, so that works. And I guess we could check that. Um, so if it was 51, we subtracted 3 and got 48. We could change it to 50. And we should get 40 as our sale price. We do. Yay! And there is testing. There's actually nice testing tools in Rust. And I don't know if those ever come up. Uh, in the, it doesn't look like they do. I think this is actually their own tests. Maybe? I'm not sure. Um, but uh, the testing system is nice, and we should talk about it at some point. Okay, so let's uh, get rid of I am done, or I'm not done. Save that. We'll move on to the next one, which will be function 5. Um Aha, yes. So expected an I-32, because we said that we were going to return an I-32, but found um, this thing. Um, I'm actually going to, well, okay, so the, re the problem is the semicolon here. Um, but I'm actually going to do the Rust hint, because I'm curious what they say about this. And there's a name for this open, close, paren thing, and I don't remember what that is. And they might uh, clarify that for us. Um, so this is a really common error that can be fixed by removing one character. It happens between because Rust distinguishes between expressions and statements. Expressions return a value, and statements re simply return a empty type, which behaves just like void in C or C++. Um, there is a name for that, which they don't tell us here, which is annoying. Um, but um, uh, because we are, because they have semicolon, it actually is assuming there's basically an empty statement here. So because of that semicolon, it's taking the value of that empty statement, which is this open close paren thing, um, and trying to return that, but you can't because we're expecting an I-32 and Rust type system is very strict about these things. Um, and as they suggest down here, we could either put a return in front of this or, and I think this is the more rusty way to do things, we could remove the semicolon. So I'm going to do that. And oops, I forgot to switch back to wrestlings. Hey, and it worked. And we could, I mean, just because it's probably worth seeing that, that this works, we could put the rest, the return in. Um, but I'm going to take the return out. Now, with the semicolon there, this will fail again. And if we put the semi, get rid of the semicolon, we should be good. Yep. Okay. Bop, bop, boop. 
And now, okay, so we finished functions. We're on to ifs. I'm going to close all of these guys and open up if one. Um, so bigger is supposed to return an I32. It doesn't return anything because we have to complete it. So complete this function, return the bigger number. Do not use another function call. Do not use additional variables. So basically, this is just if a is greater than b, the larger value is a. Otherwise, the larger value is b. And that took care of it. Do, do, do. Boop, 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 boop. of the I am done and open up if two uh, okay so here's a tight problem we are um, saying that we're turning a string slice we'll have to talk about strings and string slices when we get to that part of the tutorial, but they're, they're important and they're not trivial to understand. Um, but we read ampersand str as a string slice. So we're going to take a string slice and return a string slice. And we check to see if physish is fizz. And if it is return foo, otherwise, and here we return one, and one's not the right answer. Well, one won't even compile because we're supposed to return a string slice and one's not a string slice. So we could say, well, frog. Um, and that I think will fail the test. Yes. Okay. So now we get to see an example of a test. So it compiled, changing one to frogs, fix the compiler error, but it ran and the test failed. So the test will now tell us what else we need to do. Um, so let's look at how the test stuff works. So this is saying we're sort of starting a testing section. So we're configuring tests here. We're creating a new module. Um, so in Rust, modules would be kind of like, probably the closest thing in Java would be a package maybe. Um, but a collection of functions and or structs and other things. Um, and we're gonna call it tests. Use super colon colon star. Basically is saying import everything above into this test module. Um, so the surrounding module, and there's kind of an implicit module here in this file. The surrounding module is the super module and we're saying pull everything in. So we'll have access to fizifu in particular. And then we can have tests, which are declared with pound bracket tests. So this would be kind of like at test in um, JUnit, uh, if you're familiar with that. And then a function. And functions can have assertions. And if the assertions, any of the assertions fail, then that test will fail. So um, here we have a test that says if we pass in fizz, we should get foo. If we pass in fuzz, we should get bar. And this is the test that fails because um, uh, bar for fuzz fails because we don't get bar when we pass in fuzz. We get frogs. And I think <coughs> uh, it says here that um, like bar for fuzz we were, we, the left was frogs and the right was bar. So we wanted bar here to make the test pass. Now, we still don't have the test pass passing. We're closer though. Bar for fuzz passes, foo for fizz passes. <clears throat> so these two tests pass, but default to baz does not pass. So if we pass something else, we're supposed to get baz and we don't get that. So that means we're going to actually need um, to make our if statement a little more complicated. 
Um, right now we're defaulting to bar, but we don't want to default to bar. We want to default to baz. So actually, if we change this to baz, that will, in some sense, move the lump around. We'll have two, still have two successful tests, but this one's failing. So we're going to have to add an else if. Else if physish equal ah um, uh, fuzz, then we want to return bar. Now I think that'll work. Hey, it does. Okay. So we can see we can chain if with if else like we can in pretty much all other languages and the rest of this is pretty straightforward. And that's the end of the if section. So now we move on to ooh, a quiz. How exciting. Um, so we'll close these two guys, close that up. Quiz one. So we've done enough to have a quiz. So in 45 minutes, we've gotten to quiz one which means this is not going to get done in two hours and uh, we'll probably pick this up again when we uh, return to our streaming on uh, Friday, right? I'm doing this again on Friday. No, Saturday. What am I talking about? So when we return on Saturday, we will um, pick up where this left off. Okay, so let's pass the quiz. Um, so first thing, cannot find function calculate apple price in this scope. So Mary is buying apples. One apple usually costs two rest bucks, but if you buy more than 40 at once, each apple only costs one. Write a function that calculates the price of an order of apples given the quantity bought. No hints this time. Okay. So we'll do that. And um, now... We know that this takes a number, num apples, and you can't have negative apples, so we'll call that a US, U32. It's going to return a price, which again shouldn't be negative, so we'll say U32 there. Um, and let's just say zero uh, and see if that compiles. It does. Um, but of course it's the wrong answer. Um, so when we pass it 70, um, oh, so when we pass it 35, we ought to get 70, 40, we get 80, 65, uh, we get 65. Um, so we need to check to see if they bought, well, actually let's just, uh, Ignore that for the moment. Let's just return num apples. That'll make some of the tests pass. Uh, oh, actually, it doesn't make any of the tests pass because all of the tests have more than 40 apples. Well, that's interesting and a little weird. Uh, no, 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 no. So this last one should have passed, did it? Why did it only run one test? Oh, because we got three assertions one after the other. And when the first assertion fails, I was thinking of these as being three separate tests, but they're not. They're a single test with three assertions. And once any of the assertions fails, then um, the thing's going to die. So what we have probably would have worked for um, uh, this last one, but the last one isn't you know, being run. So if we change it to two times the number of apples, because we're paying two rust bucks per apple, and we save, that'll make the first two pass, and the last one fails, yes. So... Um, we got past here, we got past here, and then it's this guy. Um, 
that we returned 130 and we were only supposed to return 65 because that was more than 40. So if num apples greater than 40, we want to return num apples else return two time num apples. And that should pass the quiz. Yay! Um, so I think we'll call that a win and we'll move on. Okay, so now we're in move semantics. Okay, this is where life gets, oops, not modules, move semantics. This is arguably where things get complicated, interesting. Um, so this is one of the, f I think, most interesting features of Rust is the idea of ownership and move semantics. So every variable, every value I think it's, the correct term would be to say every value has to have an owner, an only one owner. So the, the various problems that come up in a lot of other languages result from two or more pieces of code owning the same value and one modifies a value when another piece of code didn't expect it to be modified and is then caught out by that modification. And in Rust, we have uh, the explicit notion of ownership and the idea that only one piece of code can own a value at a time. And so this move semantics is about how values um, ownership changes. So we're going to learn some stuff here. So vec1 equals fill vec, vec0. Um, so it thinks we might need to make that. Oh yeah. So when we push here, um, so we're adding some stuff to this vector and then we're pushing a value here. Push changes this. Right, that is modifying this vector. So a vector is be like a uh, a list or an you know a variable length array in other languages, and we can push things onto it, and that modifies the list. So we would have to say um, that vec one is mutable for this to work. So let's actually put a mute here. Boom. And that actually fixed it. So we created a vector. Um, we called fill vec with vec zero. Um, so that created a mutable copy of this vector that was passed in. Uh, we pushed 22, 44, 66, and then we returned vec. So that actually modified vec zero Is that true no it did not modify vec zero yeah i think vec zero is still going to be the empty vector um and then we push these values onto it that is vec1, and so we print vec1. It has three things, 22, 44, 68. Then we push 88 onto it, which is allowed because it's now mutable, and we get vec1 length and vec1. So it has four items, and it has these four. Now, I'm curious, print line, um, Actually, I'm going to just steal this code. But I'm going to change all this to vec0. Now, I think we might get into an ownership issue here. 
because I'm not sure we have access to the ah. Yeah. So we'll have to talk about this more later. I don't want to get too bogged down in it now. But when we pack, so here, uh, if we put this, comment this one out and put it, oh, ah, undo. Put a copy of it there. Um, now, okay. So at this point, VEC zero is empty. Length zero, no content. When we pass it to fill VEC, we are giving ownership of VEC zero to fill VEC. Um, so this is saying we're being given that vector and without some additional syntax to say we want to borrow the vector, um, this is actually giving ownership of that vector over to PhilVec. So at this point, PhilVec has ownership of this vector. It declares it as mutable and it can do that because nobody else owns it. So uh, it is the only piece of code that owns that vector. So we can say, oh, I'm gonna make this mutable now and I won't mess with anybody else. And then it pushes and then returns. So really this is a different vector now than this one. Um, and we don't have access to this one anymore. It doesn't really exist because we gave it away. It's like we had a book in our library we gave it to someone, they have it, they shredded it or fed it to their dog or colored on it with crayons or whatever they did with it, but we don't have it anymore. And when we try to do things with it here, that fails because it's like, you don't, you don't have that book anymore. You can't do that. Um, so that's one of the complicated things about um, move semantics. I'm sure there'll be more in upcoming exercises. So let's not dwell on this too much longer. Call this done. Boom. Okay. Make me compile without changing line 13 or moving line 10. So we can't move this line. We can't change this line. Um, okay. So what does the error tell us? Well, actually, let's look. So we're getting the new vector. We're filling it, so that's the same as what we saw before. Um, oh, and now we're trying to print vector zero, which is what I was trying to do a second ago. Um, and it says, oh, can't do that. Um, let's have a look at the hint and see what they suggest that we do. Because um, I think we'll basically need to be doing some kind of borrowing. Um, so vec zero is being moved into the function fill vec when we call it in line 10, which means it gets dropped at the end of fill vec, which means we can't use vec zero again on line 13. So that's basically what we talked about before. Um, we can fix this in a few ways. Try them all. Make another separate version of the data that's in vec zero and pass that to fill vec instead. Um, Make PhilVec borrow its argument instead of taking ownership of it and then copy the data within the function or to return an owned VEC I32. Make PhilVec mutably borrow its argument, um, modify it directly, then not return anything. Then you can get rid of VEC1 entirely, um, but this will change what gets printed in the first print line. Okay, well, let's try them all. Um, so the first one says make another separate version of the data that's in VEC0 and pass that to fill VEC instead. I think that that's clone. I think that if we say dot clone, that will make a copy. Oops, I guess I need to cop over here. Aha, that did work. So if you clone uh, something, you're basically making a copy of it. In this case, we're making a clone of vec0, so a copy of an empty vector, and passing that to fill vec. And 
Filvec then is sticking stuff in that copy, leaving, we still own VEC0 at that point. We've given away the copy we made of the book, but we still own, own the original book, so we can do stuff with it. So that is a way to do it. Not all data types in Rust are clonable. There's a trait that you have to implement um, if you're gonna be clonable. Uh, and not everything implements clonable, although a lot of the key pieces implement clonable. Um, uh, and I don't know if there'll be discussion of that later or not, to be honest with you. Um, but it could be a thing. Um, maybe in the traits area, we might talk about clonable again. Um, so let's see, what was idea two? Make Filvec borrow its argument instead of taking ownership of it, and then copy the data within the function in order to return an owned Vec32. So let's get rid of the clone here. Boom. Uh, now, we're going to borrow the argument. What does that mean? If we put an ampersand in front of something in an argument like this, we're saying that we're borrowing it, not um, keeping it. Um, and we get into trouble when we try to do that. Um, so here we're saying we want to borrow this. We don't want to own it. We just want to borrow it. Um, however, uh, we called this in a way that gave away, whoa, um, it's about that, gave away the vector. Um, so we also need to say we're going to pass that as a borrowed value. Um, so instead of giving away the vector, we're passing a borrowed value value instead. Now that gets the call to be happy, but the return's bad. Um, so uh, we're expecting this uh, vec here, and what we're passing back is this mutable reference. Um, and that's a problem. Um, now they suggest here trying two vec. I don't know if that's that gonna work. Try it, see. Um, no, I didn't think so. Um, basically, this is this isn't working um, because we've borrowed this value and we can't make a mutable thing here. Um, so. What we need to do is clone here, I think. Hey! So we were loaned the book. We can't own the book because we were just loaned it. That's the ampersand here and here tell us that we've been loaned the book, but we do not retain ownership of it. We don't have ownership of it. We're not supposed to make a mess of it. But we can, we have permission to copy it. And so this clones it. So we make a copy of that vector and we can then, because we own it, it can be mutable. And we're using shadowing again. So this is the same name, but now it refers to this new cloned copy, not the original. We're gonna push these values on and return that new copy. So that works. Happy day. And that is, I think, what they mean by <coughs> option two here. Um, now, option three, we would say you can have the book with mutability as an option, which means you can draw on the book. We're going to give you the vector as a mutable borrow. So we're loaning you the book. 
And we're giving you the ability to modify the book. You can scribble in it, take notes in the margin, do all the things that you know you want to do. But then when you're done, it will come back to us. Uh, and so I think there, so, and if we do that, we won't need to clone it. And um, I think that we want this to be, what is the syntax mute? Uh, no, I think it's at ampersand mute. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So here we're saying this function is going to take a mutable reference to something. It's going to borrow something, but with mutability available. Now that is Again, Rust is being very careful to make sure that everybody knows what's possible. And so if we say this is going to take a mutable reference, we've got to call it with a mutable reference. It's got to know that um, uh, we're passing it a muta mutable reference here. Um, and so... I don't think we can just do this here, can we? Oh, that did actually make that part happy. So here we're saying we're going to pass a mutable reference to this vector. We're going to loan this out. We'll have ownership again when it comes back, but while the other pl player has it, they can modify it however they want. So that connects this and this up. Now it's grumpy about the return type. Um, and if we go back to the bash, it says modify it directly, then not return anything. So in fact, we probably want to just get rid of the return altogether and get rid of this. Uh, and that didn't like oh um yeah if we do this we don't want to actually assign this to that what do they have us do there um not return anything so so really we would get rid of this And uh, what? I'm not sure what we do here with vec one. So I don't know if we just change all these to vec one, or if we say like vec one. I don't think that's going to work. Do we just have to just say mute here? So, yeah, I think that if we... So the problem is we can't we can't just assign vec zero um, to vec one here. We could clone it. Is that what they what they want? It doesn't seem right. I'm not entirely sure what they're after here. Hmm. I mean, I think if we clone it. It will compile and run. Yeah. And now VEC0 has three things and VEC1 has four things. 
Well, I'm not sure that that clone is really what they were shooting for here. Um, but I don't know that there's another good option. I kind of don't think there is. I mean, we could just get rid of Vec 1 altogether. Um, and let's see. And just change all the references to VEC1 to VEC0. Wada, 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 wada. And that still works. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure which of those they were aiming for. But they both work. So I'm going to call that good and I'm going to move on. Boop, ba -doo, move semantics three. Um, oh, so many things. Okay, make me compile without adding new lines, just change existing lines. No lines with multiple semicolons necessary. Okay, so we're making a new vector. We're calling fill vec. Um, which is gonna take ownership of that vector, push those things onto it and return it. We're going to print that. That part's all fine. Then we push and then we print again. So what's it grumpy about? Oh, no, hang on. Fill back. Cannot borrow VEC is mutable. Oh, so we're taking VEC and we're pushing it, but it's mutable. And so we don't have a mutable version of it. Um, so we need to say, let's see, and what are the rules? Okay, mute. Now, I think, th oh, that's it. Wow, that was easy. Um, yeah, because we're passing ownership here. We don't care whether it's mutable or not on this end because we're giving it away. We're like, it's, we'll never see it again. It's not our problem. Um, and so uh, it's we don't really care that the fact that we make it mutable here doesn't have to be reflected up here because we're actually just giving it away entirely. Okay, cool. Boom, ba -doom, ba -doom, ba -doom, ba -doom. Semantics four, refactor this code so that instead of having vec zero and creating the vector in main, we create it within fill vec and transfer the freshly created vector from fill vec to its caller. Okay. So we don't want this to take an argument. Um, and so basically we're going to create a new uh, vector here, I think. And then we're going to push these values and then return it. Uh, and so then this becomes this takes no arguments and then we don't even need this anymore I don't think let's see if that fix hey look at that so we can get rid of this <laughs> So um, we're uh, calling fill vec. Fill vec makes the new empty vector, pushes the things onto it, and returns it. Um, it is returning the ownership. So this is uh, when we get vec1 here, vec1 is now going to be the one owner of the vector created by PhilVec. Um, PhilVec's done, it loses any claims to that vector. And so 
VEC1, we can do things like push and stuff with it, and we can declare it to be mutable. Okay, cool. Um, let me say we're done with that. And move semantics five. Make me compile by only by reordering the lines in main, but without adding, changing, or removing any of them. Execute, blah, blah. Okay. So it is, we're declaring a mutable variable. And then Y and Z are mutable borrows of that variable. And we modify them. We add 100 to Y and 1,000 to Z. And then we assert that X is 1,200. Um, so the problem is that, oh, oh, okay. Actually, if we look at the compiler errors, Cannot borrow X is mutable more than once at a time. So that's the issue. Um, so we're loaning it to Y and then we're loaning it to Z. And then both Y and Z do things to it. And that it's like you can't have the same loan the same book to two people at once. So I think if we move this here, we can say Y gets a mutable copy reference not copy a mutable reference to x it can add 100 to it x should now be 12 200 sorry now y is done y is never referred to again so the compiler can infer that y no longer has access to it and now x it sort of comes back to x because y is done with it X can then loan a mutable reference to Z and say, hey, you can have it now. Z adds 1,000, so it was 200 before, now it's 1,200. Z is never used anymore, and so X can take it back, and we can say, hey, um, the value of X ought to be 1,200. Let's actually save that and see if that, in fact, works. It did. Happy day. Um, notice there's no output because it doesn't print anything. So syntax here, ampersand mute. We've seen this in function calls, but we haven't seen it sort of in, in line like this. So we're saying Y is a mutable reference to X. And when we have a reference, we can modify its value by using an asterisk in front of it. So the asterisk says this was a reference to something. Asterisk gives me the thing, not the reference to the thing. Okay. So it's like the difference between the title of the book and the book itself. So the title is a reference to the book, but we want to actually add 100 to the book itself. We want to write in the margin of the book. Um, and so we have to dereference. Um, the reference Y, and then down here, the reference Z. Cool. Okay. I thought that... Oh, actually, I'm going to look at the hint there. I'm curious what they have to say. Um, yeah, come on. Careful, carefully reason about the range in which each mutable reference is in vogue. Vogue, the word they want there? I don't know. Does it help to update the value of referent immediately after the mutable reference is taken? Read more about mutable references in the books section, references and borrowing. So when they talk about the book, there is a Rust book, and this link would take you there. doc.rustline.org slash book. Um, I think if you just search for Rust book, it'll get you there and it's a fairly detailed book about the language 
um, and its features with lots of examples um, and definitely recommend it if you want to learn more. Um, obviously going through these exercises there's a lot of detail that I'm not covering and in some places that I may not know because I, this is I've never really read the whole Rust book end to end. My knowledge of Rust is a little fragmentary. It's better now than it used to be but um, I can imagine that there are no doubt um, features that I don't grasp um, because I have not read carefully from beginning to end. Okay, so uh, we'll say we're done with this. And move to semantic six. Uh, you can't change anything except adding or removing references. So Rust is great to string. So this is a string slice. This turns it into a capital S string type. Um, so this type here. Um, and again, we'll have to talk about strings down in the strings section. So I won't dwell on that endlessly here. Um, so we get the data, we get, so data is a string. We get the character we call get char. Get char takes a string and returns a character data.chars.chars dot chars in a string takes characters uh, a string and gives you I think it's a vector of characters um, uh, oh it's an iterator uh, over the characters dot last gives us the last character unwrap I suspect there'll be discussion of that later um, things can fail uh, some and like last would be an example. If you called last on an empty um, iterator, then that would fail because there is no last there. Um, and so unwrap, it, for things that fail, you can either have tests like, oh, if this succeeded, do this. If it failed, do that. Unwrap is basically saying, I hope that this passes, that this succeeded. Um, please just proceed as if it did. If it didn't panic, which is kind of like throw an exception, die here now, please. Um, and so unwrap is let's hope that things worked and panic if they didn't. Um, so this is, and, and something like this is necessary because last returns an option type, as you can see, um, as the return type. And an option is basically it succeeded or it failed. And unwrap says get rid of the option wrapper around it and just return the character. And if there is no character, if the option failed, then just blow up. Um, so this returns a character, which we don't actually capture. And I don't know if we care about that. I can't change anything but adding or removing references. Um, and then string uppercase takes the string as a mutable reference to a string and replaces data with uppercase version of data and then prints it. Okay. So let's see what we get. Um, so string uppercase borrows moved data. So data um, does not have a copy, does not implement the copy trait. Um, and so when we call, I'm sorry, string does not implement the copy trait. So when we call get char, we are handing ownership over to char or to get char and we don't own data anymore. So attempts to use data here get us in trouble. Um, and so that's causing us a cons uh, an issue. Um, so we, I think, are going to need to 
can we just loan the string to get char? Is that going to be enough? Um, So I think that took care of that problem. This error, I think, I think this ampersand is bad. Um, I'm not sure I fully understand why. Let me remove it and see if that, uh, nope. Nope, nope. I'd actually liked having that ampersand there. So what's the issue? Is this genuinely a lifetime thing? I don't think we want to get into lifetimes now. Let's um let's look at the hint. Uh the first problem is get char is taking ownership of the string. So data is moved and can't be used for string uppercase. So I think we've solved that problem. Um, string uppercase's function signature will also need to be adjusted. Can you figure out how? It has to do with the ampersand character. Well, that's shocking. Okay, but we know it's in the function signature. So we we don't need to pass a reference here is that really is that maybe the issue in which case i bet we don't want an ampersand here and then maybe we don't want that Yeah, now we don't need the ampersand here. Hey, hey, okay. So let's try to make sense of what happened here. So, um, string uppercase can take ownership because there's nothing after this call. So if we hand this and say, string replication, you can just do whatever you want, um, then that works. And we can say, let's convert you to uppercase, give you, make this the, use the shadowing again, to give us a new name for that and print it out. Um, I don't does it need to be mutable? I don't know if maybe two up, uppercase requires mutability. I'm not sure. Wah, wah, wah. Yeah, apparently. Oh. Oh. What if we say let? So we weren't actually doing shadowing. Oh, okay. So we don't even need mutability. We're just passing the string in. And if we do a let, so we genuinely shadow then um, we're good. Now the problem here is I think that data is no longer uh, visible um, up here because we gave it away. Yeah. So we gave it to string uppercase here, so it's no longer accessible um, there. Hmm. I mean, this works, but I feel like it would be worth understanding how we would pass this in in a way that we could still print it. Hmm. I'm 
what time is it? It is 11.30. Yeah, let's, let's play with this a little bit. So I'm going to put this back. Okay, so that'll fail. Um, now, can we pass a reference? So you don't get to keep it, but you can borrow it. Oh, hey, that's all we need to do. And since we don't ever mutate it, um, this actually creates a new string, which is uppercase, and that's what gets printed first. And then when this returns, we print the original string unmodified, and we get that there. Awesome. Okay. I think that worked. Now, the we could explore having this modify the string. That would require making this mutable. Um, and then this would have to be mutable. Uh, let's not let's not wander down that road. Let's decide we played with this one enough, and press on. Oh, and that's the end of move semantics. So we're into primitive types. Waha! Close all these. Close that guy. Primitive types. Fill in the rest of the line that has code missing. No hints. There's no tricks. Just get used to typing these. Um, oh. So we just have to say let is evening be, mm, let's say false. And we've got good morning, but not good evening. If we change that to true, we should get good morning and good evening. Yes. Cool. That was easy. And primitive types too. Uh, so, if your character, oh, okay. Oops. So we need to let your character uh, equal syntax for characters is like, uh, 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 We'll say F. And F is alphabetical. If we change it to two, we get numeric. If we change it to ampersand, because we type those all the time these days. It's neither alphabetic nor numeric. Yay! Okay, that was easy. Um, primitive type three. Create an array with at least a hundred elements in it where the question marks are. Hmm. Let us look at the hint because I'm not sure I know off the top of my head how to make an array with a lot of elements. So we can say square bracket, a value, a semicolon, and how many. Um, okay. Well, we could do that. Um, uh, 110. Oops, switch over to wrestlings. Yay! Now, they suggest what are some other things you could have done that would turn true for dot len. I think vectors have lengths. So I think we could have said vec 
new. And now that will fail because, well, it will, oh. So if we say vec i32, is that the right syntax? No. Oh, it goes at, after the colons? No. Oh, how do you initialize a vector of integers rust create empty vector of i32 uh, so this seems to so we can declare the type So maybe we declare it on the left. Looks like we do. Okay, fine. We will declare it on the left. So, and indeed it printed the short array solution. So if we want to make it long, push a bunch of values onto it. Aha! But we declared A not to be mutable. So we couldn't push. A. Now um, we have successfully uh, pushed. I think we could also have done a string because I think strings are have dot len. But I'm going to say we're done with that and move on. Especially since there's a whole string section later. Um, so, get a slice of the array um, so the test passes. Um, so we want 2, 3, 4. We want this middle bit. And I think the syntax is something like one dot dot so this would be one two three four because it's not in, it's inclusive on the left and exclusive on the right um no did not like that oh we need to put a slice thing in front of it that's right so this is part of why this is referred to as string slices, we can take a slice out of an array or a string um, this way and we get a reference. So this didn't actually make a new array. This literally was a reference into this array. Um, and I think that these things share values. Um, so that's kind of nifty. Um, actually, I'm going to see what the does the hint give us anything interesting. Um, so there's understanding ownership slices, other slices section of the book. Um, and then there's a reference to the DREF coercion section of the book, which definitely is above our pay grade at the moment. So not going to wrestle with that. Okay. Um, next. Oh, I guess we need to come back here and, and say we're done. Wah, wah, wah. Um, destructure the cat tuple so that print line will work. 
Okay, so um, this is a tuple, basically an ordered tuple, which can have zero or more components. I think the open, close, paren, empty, void thing that we saw earlier today is actually an empty tuple, technically. Um, and uh, we can extract the pieces out of this with destructuring in a very nice way. So we can say name and age. Um, so this will take this tuple, which is this here, and it will match by position. So this Furry McPherson will be the matched to name and age will be matched to 3.5. So I think that will do the desired thing. Hey. Um, and I can we type these? Um, like if I say I32, that should fail because 3.5 is not. Uh, oh, maybe I can't type them. Looks like I can't. Okay, well then, poop. Um, I wonder if it's uh, something like string i32. Do we type them that way? Aha! Yeah, that does look like that worked. Um, okay, so we can type them if we want to. Um, and the types have to match what we're getting in. So, cool. Gonna skip on to the last primitive types one. Use a tuple index to access the second element of numbers. Uh, I think that's just square brackets. Don't know for sure. Numbers one. No. Oh, to access tuple elements, use numbers dot one. Well, okay then. Lo and behold. And so I presumably if we changed it to two, the test would fail and it would say, yeah, we were, expecting two, but we got three. Um, so go back to one and we pass. Voila, 1143. Where do we go from here? We are in uh, structs, huh? How many structs? There's only three structs things. Maybe we'll get through structs today and then we'll quit. We'll see. Close all. So structs are really important. They're ways of collecting information um, in sort of a group. Uh, you can associate functions with them in a way that's kind of like classes, but not really. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff happening in structs. Let's see how this first struct one works out. If this is pretty fast, maybe we get through the structs today. If it's pretty slow, maybe we'll wrap this up and pick up um, with structs on Saturday morning. Um, and so we are going to address all the to-dos to make this pass. Um, so, um, let's look at where things fail. So on line 24, we assert that green.name and green.hex are things. Um, so we would need to say green is color tuple struct so that at least defines green but it won't work because it can't find the fields well 
we could say um, is the syntax uh, name colon green and whoops hex colon something like that think uh, oh yeah so this part pa compiled and now this is failing to combine compile um, okay I'm not sure I know the difference between a classic C struct and a tuple struct and a unit struct I think maybe some Google aiding is gonna need to happen um, uh, so tuple struct okay I do think I know what these two are I'm less certain about the unit struct thing uh, okay well, let's go ahead. I think then this actually might be more or less correct, except for the color tuple struct hasn't been. Um, oh, this shouldn't be a color tuple struct. This should be a color classic struct, I think. Wah, wah, wah. And then. color tuple struct maybe that will cannot find unit struct in this scope I'm not sure I know what a unit struct is rust unit struct Struct, struct unit. Oh, you just make it. Okay. And uh, let's see if we made. Oh, so if we have curly braces, we can just pass the things in we don't have to pass um, name colon like I did I don't I think we can but I don't think we have to so I think here we could just say green and then here, I think it was just a unit struct. Okay, we're getting somewhere. So, oh no, maybe we do have to have color classic struct. Did expect an identifier, so maybe we do need name. Wah, wah, wah. Okay, color classic strut does not have this name field, so we need to say name. Um, stir and hex stir. Why do we need a lifetime parameter? Should those be strings? Yeah, we've got name as a string here. But they also then have to like create it as a string. I don't think if we call these strings, 
Maybe I didn't want the ampersand. May, oh, maybe they're not references to stirs. Maybe they are stirs. Yeah. So let's try stir without the ampersand. Ah. Ah. No. Hmm. Maybe we do have to make them strings. Because the, the problem is we don't know the size of the strings, and the compiler needs to have a fixed size for this struct. And so I think these either need to be references or they need to be strings with a capital S. I think the thing to do here would be to do that and then two string no oh. hang on call the conversion method yeah two string okay ah that work to compile that yes okay so now classic tuple struct um, here we had to make one so a pair Okay, it's just open and it's just types. Okay, types without names. That's what I'm after here. So when we declare this, we provide types, but we don't provide names. So we're going to have string, string. And again, we'll have to convert. I wonder, probably not. Okay, so that compiles and everything passes. And so units are just kind of content free structs. Um, and you can't put anything in them. Um, and they're useful for as kind of placeholders and traits, apparently. Now I wonder, do I, if I had changed, could this have been stir stir? I doubt it. Yeah, it doesn't have a known size at compile time. So that's not gonna work. Well, we could do a box. Yeah, I think I'm not going to mess with that. We'll leave this as strings, I think, for now. Okay. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, so I think we'll stop there. It's, it's 5 to noon, and um, I don't know that we're going to get through... Uh, the next two structs in six minutes. So I think we'll call this quits. Um, thank you for joining me. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll pick up again Saturday with, uh, we got structs to do. We got quite a few things to do. So I'm not sure we would even finish on Saturday. And it's going to get harder because there'll be more things where I'm like, I don't really remember how to do this. Um, so this might take us a couple of weeks. We'll see how things go. Um, so thanks a lot for listening. 
I'm going to wrap this up and we will see you in the next one.